Michaela's story is one steeped in mystery, full of night terrors, a supernatural encounter with the entity, and the disappearance of a friend. She is no ordinary survivor, and so it is no surprise that she has a very extraordinary tale. This is the tragedy of Michaela Reed. Added during the half chapter, The Hour of the Witch, Michaela Reed became the first original survivor to be added to the game as part of a half chapter. Not much is known about her origins, which is rare for an original survivor's lore. We do not know where she was born or much about her childhood, just that her father often took her sailing and he was a warm and lighthearted individual. We get the picture that they had a close and loving relationship. Strangely, nothing at all is said about her mother, only periodic and generic mentions of other family. In the most recent Tome 13, we get a glimpse of her in second grade, moving to a new school, not knowing anyone, and eating all by herself. This kind of experience would lead her to fear being alone later in life. We also learn from her tome memories that Michaela was dyslexic. Even at this young age, Michaela was fond of storytelling, despite repeated discouragement from her teachers telling her that she was not a good writer. At the age of 16, we are told of her father's passing. The grief and pain of his loss almost caused her to lose herself, but surrounded by the support and love of her friends, she pulled herself together and moved forward. Storytelling became an outlet for her grief, focusing on stories described in her lore as full of daunting danger and hard-earned survival. She also began reading horror stories written by others as a form of escapism, which in no doubt in turn influenced her own writings. It's no surprise then that autumn became her favorite season, and each year she would host a Halloween party for her friends, which of course, in addition to playing scary games and eating homemade treats, included telling stories. As years followed, this interest in the macabre led her to study witchcraft, specifically blessings and palm reading, along with a few plant-based spells. This in turn became the gateway into creating her own line of homemade and natural skincare products and it became her goal to live off the sales of these goods. Until she could reach financial independence, however, she also worked as a barista at an artsy coffee shop in town. It was there that she hosted an open mic night on Fridays, using that opportunity to tell the horror stories that she had written as the outlet for the grief over losing her father. Public speaking filled her with fear, but telling her stories was also how she made sense of everything and connected with people. Not wanting to let her friends down, she would push through that fear and present her stories in front of the audiences that would gather at the coffee shop. It didn't always go well. Once she froze and forgot how the story began, so she stayed late after her shifts to memorize her stories. We are treated to three of her crafted stories within the Midnight Grove tome, which range from disgusting to disturbing. That said, one of those three stories is worthy of special attention here, as it foreshadows the entity's realm with scary accuracy. Welcome one, welcome all, to the place in town to get a story and a coffee. I can tell you where the coffee comes from, but please don't ask me where the stories and characters come from, because basically I have no clue. Some say it's the aroma of freshly brewed coffee that inspires me. Others say I'm able to tap into the endless memory streams pouring out of the infinite kettle that is the multiverse. I think it's a little bit of both. This one comes from the grains I observed at the bottom of my espresso cup a few days ago. It kind of resembled a bell, so I'm calling this one the bell from hell. Toby and his sister were always up to no good, and this time they snuck into an old, overgrown junkyard that many claimed was haunted. Despite the rumors, the teens played in the rusty wrecks, honking horns, kicking windshields, and of course, scaring each other to hell. It's fun here, said Toby. It is, Tina agreed. As night wore on, Toby hid in the trunk of an old sedan with the intention of scaring his sister. But Tina followed a trail he unwittingly left and rah, scared him instead. Toby cursed and Tina <laughs> ran off, promising she would get him again. She quickly rushed to the old compactor and hid in a half-squashed station wagon filled with a strange black fog. That's odd, she thought, and didn't think any more of it. But she probably should have thought a little more of it, since strange black fog isn't exactly an omen, as you know from my previous stories. Anyhow, Tina waited patiently in the back seat. When an hour had passed, she began to worry. Slowly, she craned her head up to peek out the window when, rah, Toby slammed the station. Tina nearly jumped out of her skin, hitting her head against the ceiling of the half-crumpled car. But Toby couldn't help but laugh. And as he laughed, he looked down into the churning black fog and saw a bell, a strange-looking iron bell, unlike any bell he had ever seen before. Will you look at this, he said, holding up the bell, examining the craftsmanship. Then he grabbed a stick from the ground and clanged the bell stupidly. The ominous ring echoed through the abandoned junkyard as the black fog thickened and swirled around them. 
before they could say anything about the strange fog, the compactor came to life. Tina felt her heart fall into the pit of her stomach, and she screamed in horror. Toby dropped the bell, grabbed her hands, and yanked her out just in time. Breathlessly, they watched the station wagon as the creaking ground had shattered into scrap. There was a long, tense silence as they wondered what had given such power to an otherwise rusted and broken compactor. Just then, the bell rang again. This time, behind them, Tina exchanged a look with Toby and swallowed a growing thickness in her throat. They turned slowly to face nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing but the swirling fog. It was probably just their imaginations. Or was it? For just as they released a collective sigh, the bell rang once again, and something suddenly materialized out of the fog. Within moments, they were face to face with a wraith. The wraith instantly grabbed Toby by the neck with one arm and lifted him high in the silvery moonlight, his feet dangling, his arms flailing, his lips quivering with fear. Tina gasped and stumbled back into her haunches. The wraith smashed Toby against the ground with a powerful thud. He raised a rusted wheel wrench and proceeded to bludgeon his head to scrap, blood and gore splattering everywhere. Then the wraith turned to face Tina with his creepy bell and dead eyes. Covered in her brother's warm blood, Tina screamed until her lungs gave out and waited for the bell to toll. Now, what the siblings didn't realize was they had entered a kind of dimensional pocket that had brought them to another world. See, there are these pockets or holes in the world that lead to all kinds of dark places, places that defy reality, dark places that make all our combined depictions of hell seem like a flower garden. But that's another story for another dark and creepy Let's just say that for Toby and Tina, death was not an escape. Michaela had a best friend and roommate who would attend these open mic nights and record her stories to be posted online for others to see. His name was Julian, and believing in her, he secretly submitted one of these recordings to a famous festival devoted to Halloween storytelling. The judges enjoyed it so much that they invited her to tell one of her stories at their grand finale. Winning this would give her the financial freedom she was seeking to finally be able to launch her own line of products. She quickly got busy writing a new story specifically for the festival. Working through the night at her kitchen table, she tried finding just the right beginning for the story, but without success. She wanted to write the perfect tale, one that had not been done before, one that brought out people's deepest fears and held them captivated. But the failure to get started was making her nauseous. Self-doubt began to creep in. That's when the nightmares began. Nightmares that would leave her waking, gasping for air. One particular nightmare played on repeat, night after night. Her lore tells us exactly what this terrible dream consisted of. She was dragged down a cold set of stairs and thrown into a dark basement. Then her lungs would be set ablaze by a sharp iron hook, stabbing her in the chest. A dark figure would pull on the hook and hoist her from the ground, slowly, until the pain waked her. In a second dream, Michaela found herself together with another woman she had never met in a dark and eerie place. This woman was quiet, kind, and fascinated by the nature around her but she had difficulty understanding the emotions of others and connecting with them. She's described as having beautiful black hair and wearing thick plastic glasses. By this description, we know that the woman Michaela was dreaming of was Claudette. But suddenly the dream becomes quiet, only for that silence to then be shattered by the roar of a chainsaw in the hands of a badly scarred monster. At this, Michaela screams and wakes. There seemed to be a connection between these nightmares and the story she was writing for the festival. The more she wrote, the more sinister the repeated nightmares became. As you can imagine, the constant waking from these terrible dreams began to take a toll on her physical health. Understandably exhausted from the lack of sleep, anxiety began to creep in, and her work at the coffee shop was affected. Before this, she made a habit of blessing the coffee beans, but that no longer occurred. She was too distracted. Nightmares continued. After yet another night of waking up screaming in terror, she turned to her friend and roommate Julian to help understand what was happening to her. Julian agreed to watch and record her while she slept to see if he could spot anything out of the ordinary. Exhausted, Michaela quickly fell asleep. Not long after, her breathing changed and she started twitching, but that wasn't the only thing that was unusual. Julian looked up to see that Michaela was levitating above her bed. These were certainly no normal nightmares. He attempted to wake her, but was unsuccessful. Michaela then began to scream. At this point, he had abandoned his attempts to snap her out of it and was turning to the phone to call for help when he heard a loud noise down the hall. He turned to look towards the noise and saw something not of this world. 
What is described as a large spidery fang was breaking through the bathroom door. At this point, Michaela came to and saw what we know as the entity ripping the door apart. Instinctually, she slammed the bedroom door, which the two of them quickly moved to barricade in an attempt to give them whatever chance they could to keep that spidery monster from getting inside. Before they could do so, however, the power cut, the lights went out, and they were in complete darkness. The power outage lasted only a second, and when the lights came back on, the loud noises were replaced by an unnatural silence. Slowly, the pair made their way into the hallway. The door to the bathroom that they had both watched be destroyed was back on its hinges and in perfect condition. How could this be? Both Michaela and Julian had seen the same thing, so it could not have been a dream or a hallucination. Besides, Julian had been recording the entire event, and the terrible sounds were there on the recording, but nothing appeared damaged or out of place anymore. Was it some kind of vision into an alternate realm or dimension? Understandably, neither of them slept much the rest of that night. Despite this, Michaela went to work the next day as normal, and Julian posted his recording of the previous night's events online. We are not told why, but once her shift was over, Michaela came home to ask him to remove it. When she arrived, however, Julian was nowhere to be found. Not thinking too much of it, she thought he must still be at school. As we can imagine, she probably didn't want to be alone in the house after everything that had happened, so she left. This is where we, the audience, are told the terrifying reality that just as the door closed behind her, Julian's stifled cry emerged from the same bathroom that had been supernaturally ripped apart not even 24 hours earlier. No one would see Julian again. Outside of the house, Michaela walked to her car, but she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. Out of the corner of her eye, she spotted a shadow moving. She panicked and ran to her car, locking the doors, but frantically looking around, she could not see anything that was a threat. So she shook it off as just her nerves and drove away. The next day was Halloween, and that evening would bring the festival for which Julian had lovingly secured her a spot. But Michaela could still not make contact with him, even missing her shift at the coffee shop to look for him. Not losing hope, Michaela thought for sure he would come to the festival to watch her perform. The problem was, with everything going on, she hadn't even written the story yet. But emboldened by Julian's faith in her, she resolved to tell the story that she had on her heart. That evening, Michaela took the stage dressed in costume and looked for Julian in the audience, but he wasn't there. Instead, she was greeted with expectant looks and a deafening silence. She began to grow nervous as she grabbed the mic and prepared to tell her story. This is also where we get some indications that Michaela was beginning to believe that Julian was now in another realm, and hoping that somehow, on this Halloween night, he would still hear her story. Mindfully, she closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Silence hung in the air, broken only by the caw of a crow watching her from the darkness of an old oak tree. As she exhaled, the anxiety left her. She was ready to tell her story. Her lore tells us that she spoke into the microphone in a deep, haunting voice. She narrated a tale of billowing winds on a cold autumn night, of a loyal friend disappearing before daylight, of forgotten victims hiding in the wings of darkness, of throbbing graves sealed with terrible secrets, and of eternal night in the shadow of death. Michaela pointed at the night sky and said that no darkness was truly beyond light. Even on this moonless night, the sky shined with long dead stars. As she was saying this, Michaela Reed disappeared in a thick black fog, never to be seen again. At least, not in this realm. Well, those who knew her were left without answers, we of course know that this was not the end of Michaela Reed. Far from it. After her disappearance at the festival on the night of Halloween, Michaela awoke in an otherworldly realm, shrouded in fog and marked by pain and suffering, hope and desperation, darkness and fear. She would feel like she was living one of her stories. It was as if whatever inspired her writings had given her a glimpse into this other, darker world. Michaela would soon band together with others in a fight for survival within this realm. Despite their initial skepticism and desire that she would spend more time helping them with machine repair and less time playing with piles of creepy bones, her teammates would soon discover her abilities to be of particular usefulness. Michaela's understanding of the supernatural would allow her to see things that others could not and make her powerful enough to alter the very trials that awaited them. She would not only eliminate dangerous hexes, but also create protective spaces that would both obscure their tracks and provide healing to their wounds. Her abilities would quickly become a source of protection and comfort amidst the horror. Michaela Reed's tragedy became their blessing. There is one question, however, that remains to be answered. Having survived this long and with daylight about to break on the horizon, could Michaela find Julian within the fog? I hope you enjoyed this first entry into our lore series. 
A special thank you to my wife, Mrs. Roberts, for providing Michaela's voice for her story. If you enjoy my content and would like to see more of it, would you please consider subscribing and helping us get to 2,000 subscribers by the end of the year? And as always, you were awesome, stay awesome, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.